So, who's designing your healthcare? There's a very short answer. No one is. That's not to suggest that there aren't people out there that are incredibly skilled, passionate about improving healthcare. But there's no one really who has this professional skill set, the strategic ownership, or is focused on understanding how many great things come together to make a system. I think there's a role for design here. I think while no one is designing our health or healthcare systems, they've grown organically through time, they need a redesign. And I think there's luckily a great opportunity, and it's caught in this sentence here or this quote, gentlemen, we have run out of money. It's time to think. So we've heard already about the pressures, um, and here in Europe we know very well what the economic realities are. When budgets get cut by 50%, you don't have a smaller healthcare system. You need to fundamentally rethink what it is. And as we think into the future, I think what we're going to realize is that we need to let go of a model that we've inherited, which is episodic and symptomatic model of care. Imagine this model in any other context. I flew from Helsinki to come here. Imagine if flying was episodic and symptomatic, the way that we would govern flying. You'd go in the morning and the pilot, you look into the cockpit and you see the pilot with all of the dashboards and looking at all the radars and so on and so on. You get on the same flight in the evening and it's all shut off. And then you'd ask him why. Oh, we, we just do that once in a while. Imagine if things happen only when they're episodic. So you're flying and the plane crashes and only then do we tend to things. This whole notion that care is delivered episodically, randomly, I would almost argue, and based only when symptoms occur, is pretty flawed. There's a, there's a great movie called Il Gatto Pardo by Giuseppe Tomasi Lampedusa that tells the story of Italy and how Italy became what it is. And it's really about the unification of... Um, sorry, it's not flipping forward. So anyhow, it's about the unification of Italy and how... Um, how uh, Sicily was brought in. And there is a moment here, which I hope I can show you. I'm going to have to flip out of this. I'm really sorry. There we go. And there's a moment where the prince is, uh, and this is actually Burt Lancaster, um, and it's one of these exquisitely dubbed movies, so he looks like he's speaking perfect Italian. And, and he basically says... Um, He's saying, you know, it's really difficult. Basically, Italy is a feudal system. Basically, he's the prince. There's a certain way of governing. And now they want to create a new Italy. And, and his problem is this. He says, mine is an unhappy generation straddling two worlds and uneasy in both. He recognizes the old system, the feudal system, no longer works. He realizes there needs to be a better system out there. He's uncomfortable because he knows he can't dwell in the past. And he's uncomfortable because he doesn't know how to be in the future. This is our problem. We've inherited things, we know how those work, we've created legacies, we've created careers and professions and knowledge. We recognize that that doesn't work anymore, and yet we're quite uncomfortable going into this new future. So I have three very simple design principles I want to share, and then I'm going to get into quite a meaty conversation here. The first one is when we talk about government, and I want to talk about government because government has usually been the owner of these kinds of challenges. Unfortunately, when we have hard times, people talk about smaller government. We need to shift the conversation. It's not about smaller government, it's about smarter government. I don't care about a government that does half the crappy stuff it used to do. I'm interested in a government that does twice the better stuff that he used to do. So it's about the smartness of government and not the size of government. The second thing is, is we have to stop improving the past. We have to think about actually designing the future. I'll come back to this, but what worked so well in the past won't work in the future. It's very hard for politicians, for individuals to understand and accept that. What brought us so much benefits won't be the thing that is going to help us in the future. And the third thing is we need to get away from the rhetoric of innovation to actually resourcing it. 
if you follow newspapers, politicians are becoming more and more aware the word innovation also resonates quite nicely, and there is conversations about transforming government. The problem is, is no one is resourcing it. There's actually no money going to this. There's actually no professional skill sets going specifically to innovating government. So let me bring, I think, a kind of fundamental concept in this, which is impossible projects. I think we would all agree that healthcare is an impossible project. I want to uh, suggest that when you take on the impossible, it forces you to rethink all the principles that you know. And by doing so, it can lead to two things. One, of course, tragedy and disaster. But the optimistic interpretation, which I want to, in a way, convey to you, is that by rethinking principles, you get much better, much faster, much more impactful solutions. Here's a very simple way of looking at this. This is 1962. John F. Kennedy is talking about going to the moon. Imagine this. Seven years later, a man landed on the moon. Seven years before, in 1962, we didn't have the institutions, we didn't have the science, we didn't have the knowledge, we didn't have really the professions to put a man on the moon. In seven years, we reorganized institutions, knowledge, incentives, professions, we invented stuff, and we got a man on the moon. And listen to how John F. Kennedy talks about it. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. So, I find that a remarkable speech. I think politically it's a remarkable speech for the clarity with which he speaks. Now granted, it was the 60s, and I think to be a politician in the 60s was a very different thing from being a politician in this day and age. But I think this whole idea that we do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard, it forces us to rethink everything. And when you rethought everything, it allows you actually to achieve a leap forward. Wow, that was quite literally a leap. Should we just call it an evening? There we go, all right. So, what should we do? Am I okay? Well, le let me continue while maybe we get the image up here. Um, if you're gonna go to the moon, what do you do? You need different kinds of people, you need different kinds of incentives, you need different ways of thinking about planning and resourcing, right? When I worked for the Finnish government, for the Finnish Innovation Fund, and we talked, and I'm just gonna use this as a kind of placeholder, about going to the moon, everybody's like, yes, this is exactly what we need to do. But you know what? I wanna know the full budget, the exact schedule, I wanna know how you're gonna do it and what your deliverables are. Well, how can you do that? You know the budget for going to the moon was $7 billion? It ended up costing $25 billion, right? In this day and age, if you hold people accountable for sticking to a budget, and they exceeded by three, four fold, right? It's tragedy, it's horrible, you can't do that. So you need to resource things differently. If no one's ever done it before, what are your basis for budgeting? So you cannot hold people accountable to budgets for stuff that you've never done before, right? If there's nothing to copy, we didn't go to the moon by looking at how cars worked and thought about making a bigger car. We actually had to rethink. You need people who are predisposed not to look how the world works now, but to imagine how it could work. I think accountants, with no disrespect, are really good, probably, and I'm using that as a placeholder, to thinking about things being in the boxes that they need to be. I don't think I would want designers doing my accounting. In the same way, I don't necessarily want the placeholder for accountant to be thinking creatively about other things, right? So we need to think about the kinds of personalities that people have, the kinds of teams, the kinds of incentives, and how we build that forward. 
Do we think we're going to have some images? Because I'll just do it without. I'll just keep going, and then we'll, we'll see. I'll look at the images over here and have fun on my own. So in 2010, there was um, a town called Constitucion uh, that was devastated by the tsunami there. And um, this is a town of almost 100,000. And the leadership of that community had a very difficult and important decision to make. How are they going to rebuild? They could do it the traditional way, like we've always done, right? What worked so well in the past, just extend that a little bit. Uh, that is going through a kind of formal planning process and they rebuild. So let me give you a little bit of a, a baseline for this. Um, in Helsinki, but this would apply probably to your communities too, uh, a planning process, a master planning process on average takes 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years for people to agree where the pencil lines are on paper. We're going to agree on a piece of paper. This is not to build, start construction, or even move in. So they said, no, we can't do that. We can't afford people to wait around for 10 to 15 years before we even agree what we're going to do. So we're going to do what takes 10 to 15 years, and we're going to do it in 90 days. Okay? This seems an impossible task. The beauty of that is that it's crystal clear to everybody that what they know needs to go right out the window. The processes they have need to go right out the window. And so they did. They redesigned the process. They redesigned the preconditions for delivering a very different kind of solution. So the first thing they did, they cleared the main square and they put a tent up and that was their design headquarters. They had a design team working there with a list of priorities on the outside. And people could come and see what are the hot topics of the day. But that's not enough. That's not real engagement to say, come to my house if you're interested. The real engagement is actually going on the terms of citizens into the communities and engaging them on their terms and their language and understand what drives and ticks them. They did the political process of decision making with the process of designing with the process of engagement, all simultaneously. 90 days later, they had a master plan. The city voted. 97% of the citizens of Constitución voted for the master plan. And I would ask any one of you to give me any corner of democracy on this planet that can give you those kinds of figures. So the question is, when you take on impossible challenges, it can force you to rethink the principles fundamentally and what we get is we get smarter government. We get faster, better, cheaper results. Right? They didn't go about this by doing fewer public hearings, which, by the way, usually don't work very well. So we'll do just less of that. No, they redesigned everything. So I think this redesign question is not about dri being driven by costs. It's about being smarter and delivering better solutions, which invariably will lead to better outcomes. Now, why is it so hard for governments to be smart? Well, very simply, I would say we live in a different world. We have the legacy of 18th century institutions trying to deal with 21st century problems. I frequently use examples, so bear with me. But one of my pet peeves is a ministry we have in Finland called the Ministry of Telecommunication and Transportation. And it just a bit mind-moggling to try to understand who came up with that concept. Now, the only uh, answer I found is uh, going back to the 18th century. Imagine the day when in Finland we started to build our first train systems. And somebody had a brilliant idea that, hey, we should put phone lines going along the train tracks. And as we were building our first road infrastructure, somebody had a brilliant idea. Guess what? We should put pony with the mail on the roads, right? So back then it made sense to create an organization that would help coordinate the way we move and the way we communicate. But in this day and age, does tweeting obey any of the laws of an airport or a highway? No. And yet we're trying to solve these issues through these institutions. The other way to look at it is we don't have institutions for some of the most pressing issues. There is no institution that is focused on climate change, for example, in Finland. To do that, you need to go to about seven different ministries, one to get energy, the other one to mobility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? They all have different incentives. They have different cultures. And the ability to work across is nil, very limited. So any innovation of the whole is going to happen in spite of our institutions, not because of our institutions. This goes also to our system of decision making. We have politicians whose job it is to create visions and civil servants or experts whose job is to explain how we're going to get there. This idea that we can plan and implement, envision and create as two kinds of separate domains is just flawed. We don't have the skill sets, 
to know how visions are created anymore. We don't know what works. And we actually need to think, if we thought in terms of planning, we need to think that prototyping is the new planning. So let me give you the history of Finland in a, in a GDP chart, because they're always very exciting. This is indexed to 1900. Right? And you can see the growth in our country was quite phenomenal. Right? And in fact, if one were to focus around the 50s and 60s, what happened then, as you need to realize, is before the 50s, we all lived in the woods. And then five minutes went by, and suddenly we had schools, hospitals, and all kinds of systems. The transformation was remarkable. And I think everybody saw the power and the benefits of central planning. Hmm? And so what happened was that this system that worked so well began to focus on how to improve this way of working. And generations of leaders that saw the benefits of central planning would go on to lead institutions and organizations and further cement and further find efficiencies in that way of doing. And in the 90s, we actually had a very severe recession. You can see it in that dip. We had 20% unemployment. We had a banking crisis. And guess what happened? Our system was so great that we just picked up right up and kept going. Now, the problem is, is that the, it, the success breeds contempt. There is a cultural belief that what worked so well in the past will work well in the future. And there is this kind of imaginary trajectory that we're on. Despite the rhetoric, this is a deeply culturally seated thing. People are not logical. They will say one thing, and they will behave differently. The reality in Finland is this is that. And if I were to be a bit negative, I would say this is what's happening. There is a huge cultural delta, I would say, between the memory of what works so well and the reality of today. How do we bring these together, not in five, not in 10, not in 20 years, but right now? And for me, design is, yes, about services, yes, about products, but more fundamentally about the redesigning the engine that can deliver. How do we redesign the culture, the incentives, the structures, the behaviors of government so that it can begin to create different kinds of solutions, different kinds of products and services. In 2008, when I was working for the Finnish Innovation Fund, I had the honor of being on a team that worked on a real estate project. And the real estate project's objective was, yes, to develop a block in downtown Helsinki, but to use it as a Trojan horse to change the marketplace. We wanted to create zero carbon marketplace in Finland. Now, that involves many different issues. And yes, at the end of the day, we delivered a building. But more importantly, we delivered an architecture of a solution. Because to deliver a building that creates a marketplace that does not exist quite yet, we had to take and understand what are the different factors to create this new reality. We had to, for example, change the Finnish fire regulations to allow for wood to be used in buildings an industry that was very concrete intensive and hence very energy intensive. Wood has the benefit of absorbing CO2, and actually the more you, wood you use in buildings, the more of a carbon sink you create nationally. So changing fire regulations has not just a carbon benefit, but has a huge economic benefit on our industries, uh, forest industries. We had to activate citizens because our partners, our real estate developers, said they know the marketplace. And you can have any car you want as long as it's black. The Helsinki newspaper on Sunday has about 20 pages of apartments and they all look the same. Because from their perspective, they see the market and a marketplace that has one solution. We had to activate citizens to actually understand that there are many more desires and needs out there in their emerging markets that we can respond to. We need to come up with new retail and service models, new investment partnerships, the volatility of having small businesses that can guarantee uh, rent for six months as opposed to the big chains that can guarantee you for 10 years means you need a very different business model and how do you actually make the economics of the block and the investment work. Smart interfaces so people can actually make informed decisions. When do I use my energy? When is it low carbon? When is it high carbon? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No one is doing this work. No one is actually looking at the architecture of the overall solution. And I'm afraid that a lot of good ideas don't create a great system. In the US, there is more healthcare innovation than there's ever been before, patents, you name it. And yet healthcare overall is in decline. Costs are going up and outcomes are coming down. It's counterintuitive 
But the fact is, it's many great things don't happen. So no one owns this. Ministries are doing different things. They're pushing and pulling in different ways. It's creating zero sum on a lot of these issues. So when we talk about strategic design, not just service or product-oriented design, it's really about taking the questions all the way past the kind of root issues. Design has traditionally been very close to solutions, and we've been burdened in a way by the framing of a problem that's already situated in the context of a given world. If we need to go into a world where we have to re-understand principles, we need to have the capacity to go back. And by going back, we can begin to understand actually what are the bigger issues that are actually driving these opportunities. So I want to be, just for a few minutes, be counterintuitive with you, because being counterintuitive means you're beginning to go against the mainstream way of thinking. By nature, it's not the intuition of how we would think about things normally. This is one way of maybe unpacking this. So in Finland, when I was at the fund, we looked at dropouts in education actually as a huge opportunity to innovate. Usually dropout, even the term suggests that it's somebody who's failed and is a burden on the system. But what if they had a different learning need, a more extreme, as we've heard before, learning need? And if I deliver a system that can deliver value for them, I'm pretty sure I can create a more robust and resilient system for everybody else. So let's think of dropouts not as a burden, but as lead users. Free housing. Utah, the state of Utah, realized that it was costing them more to keep homeless people on the street than to give them free housing. The emergency room costs, jail, and other services that the municipality was responsible for from other buckets of spending were 16,000, over $16,000. On average, the cost of giving free housing was 11,000. They have now, they started this program in 2007. Um, next year, they are on path to eradicating homelessness by spending less and providing better value. A bit counterintuitive, especially in the US context of public spending. Innovation within healthcare does not equal better care. I just explained this. Lots of great products, lots of great new things don't add up to create positives of some. You need something more to understand that. And lastly, I would say actually, a bit counterintuitive, but the best healthcare is actually maybe no healthcare. Right? We have an odd incentive that the more healthcare you give usually means that the sicker you are, so the inverse actually works. I'll talk about a project in just a minute that was looking at stroke healthcare delivery in the US. And we came up with a different model, a fairly radical different model of, of, of providing in what we thought would be better outcomes at lower cost. Now, one of the major hospital, US hospitals, adopted this model, and I went to visit them about a year ago. And I worked with the stroke team, and I said, so what's going on? They said, you know what? We're having better outcomes at lower costs, meaning our patients are, on average, healthier, and we're using less services. To which I said, you have a problem, because you're a for-profit organization. And what you're basically doing is you're selling less products, less services. So there is an incentive that's not aligned with how we want to deliver healthcare and the ultimate objective of healthcare, which is no healthcare. So one of the basic questions when you go back to first principles, imagine that we did not have a healthcare system. Given everything we know now, given everything that we can do today, how would you do that? I had the good fortune of going back to Harvard a few weeks back, and I was visiting friends in healthcare, and it's quite astounding what's actually happening. This is not science fiction. This is a human on a chip. This is real tissue from human beings on a chip. There's a chip for a lung with real lung tissue, liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They can be all hooked up, and we can have a body on a chip. They actually biologically work together. Now, a lot of drug cost is because we do tests on mice, and the way mice behave actually has absolutely nothing to do with humans. So when you take a success in a mouse and put it in a human, rarely do you have any success. Now we can actually do drug tests specifically on human tissue and understand with 100% accuracy how we'll behave in humans. Now, there are many other things that are happening. There's drugs on a chip I saw. We can put drugs in capsules, in a chip, into the body, and with a remote control or with a program, we can open those up and we can put targeted medicine into targeted spaces. Genome sequencing, 
It used to cost $10 million to sequence. Today we do a sequence in, with $1,000. We're getting to the point where we can sequence each other's genes and know actually genetically what your footprint is. We can do drugs that are actually with your lung tissue, delivered in your body when you need it, where you need it. We have monitoring that's going to be continuous. We're going away from this symptomatic, episodic way of caring to actually having completely tailor-made ways of continual care. This is quite radical. So I think what I'd like to share is for us to really have a transformation, we need to step out of the current logic and kind of redefine the terms of the debate. And I want to bring three things, bear with me. But the first one is this question of systemic. So when I was at, teaching at Harvard, um, I ran a project called the Stroke Pathways Project. Let me give you a little bit of background about stroke. Stroke is a disruption of blood flow to the brain. Right? So vessels go up. The strokes we were looking at were ischemic strokes. So imagine it like your plumbing. It's the plumbing where stuff gets stuck. It's not the kinds of uh, plumbing problems or the plumbing bursts. Those are hemorrhagic. So 80% of all strokes are blockages. And it means that blood will be disrupted to your brain. And your brain can survive without nutrients and oxygen for a bit. But then at some point, it will just shut off and die. And then depending where you have the stroke, it may be a minor symptom or it may be fairly major or you could die. In 1996, before 1996, the modality of treatment for stroke care was you would go to the hospital, the doctor would say, I think you have stroke, give you a glass of water, and ask you to wait. There was no treatment. In 1996, a drug was approved called TPA, which if we go back to the plumbing analogy, is basically in the US, we, there's Drano. So it's a liquid you pour into the pipe, and it dissolves the pipe. They did the study on many, many patients. They gave it after five minutes of a stroke, one hour, two hours, five hours, 10 hours, and they realized on average, three hours is the optimal time, okay? And a belief in a system and a principle was born that guides stroke care to date. Now, a bit of the background of this. One, a highly integrated project means many different professions need to come together and work as teams. Easier said than done. The second is you need to have a kind of governance or design model. So we were up here in the design team. That was my responsibility. But we also had an advisory group. These were the stakeholders. There was the CEO of GE Healthcare who do the devices, the CEO of Glaxo who does the drug, uh, people from government, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, to get advice, but more importantly, to begin to make this project their project because it makes no sense to come up with great innovations and then try to convince the world of them. You need to make your ideas their ideas. And thirdly is a very simple idea of a care cycle, that we need to look at this condition from birth to death, cradle to grave, and this little blip in your life, which is the acute moment, understand what are the things that are happening during a stroke. And lastly, field work, which means actually embedding yourself in the problem and seeing it in a kind of Noah's Ark way from many perspectives and many contexts. It's not enough to go to big hospital or small hospitals or elderly people or the relatives of. You need to see it very holistically. I mention this because these are the preconditions for success. And this is part of redesigning the engine, having the capability to think about these things that then lead you into a different place. So let me just point to one very simple question. 1996, TPA, three hours, this will solve the problem. Now, the medical community thought that that was a solution, and you have to trust me now, that means you have 30 minutes to get to the hospital, right? Because three hours is the moment you get the drug. You get a stroke, it'll take you a while to call, then the ambulance comes, takes a while, you go to the ER, there's a bit of screening and imaging, and before you get the drug, et cetera, et cetera. So you have 30 minutes to drive. Now. If you were in the US, and maybe in Europe too at the time, uh, there's a lot of uh, policy around getting patients to the hospital fast. There's a lot of ads that if you get a stroke, go fast. Because the general perception was that the problem was not in the system. The system was perfect. The problem was people weren't coming to the hospital in time. And that's, if we could solve that, we would have the perfect system. Okay, so I want to take you through uh, looking at the problem at different scales on one dimension only, is do people live within 30 minutes of a hospital that delivers stroke care. Nobody had actually really looked at this very basic question, okay? So we took census data from the US, darker places where more people live. The little red dots, you don't see them now, you see them in a second. And these are all the hospitals that deliver some level of stroke care in the US. The first problem was there was no unified database. There probably isn't one for, the, for Europe either. There's probably national ones. So when you live on borders, you don't quite know 
what capabilities exist closer to you on the other side, necessarily. All right, what I'm gonna do is 30 minutes, I'm gonna translate that to 30 miles, because in the US you drive 60 miles an hour and half of that is 30 miles. I'm gonna imagine that we fly like birds in a straight line. So I'm taking a very Euclidean approach to time for the time being, okay? So bear with me. So you're gonna see little circles that emanate, and these circles capture in an ever-expanding radius, the population in there, and then it reverts back to my 30 miles. So if I was a bird flying at 30 miles an hour, this is the maximum distance I could be away from one of those dots to get to care, okay? So what we realize with this very Euclidean, very imprecise model, there's a glass ceiling of about 45 to 50%. So if you convinced everybody in the US to call immediately, you have a maximum threshold of about half the population could even get to care. Now, Massachusetts, being a very progressive state, realized that there's lots of gaps in here, that this is actually a bit of a flawed thing. So they enacted a bit of policy, which made their 79 hospitals become stroke hospitals. I had a CEO in Western Massachusetts cry to me because she was asked to provide 24 hours a day neurological services for those very few stroke cases that may come in at the expense of other services. This is a very burdensome model, but we put a lot of political capital in this and a lot of financial capital into an idea that was a bit undercooked. But if you do the same analysis, you realize, oh my God, within five to 10 miles, we're not even close to 30 miles, which is our cutoff, you have almost 100% of the population within care. So the policy looks like it's working on paper. One problem, many problems actually, but just one I'll point out. There's two areas that have no coverage. If you've been to Massachusetts, that's Cape Cod, and the Berkshires. These are the two most popular travel destination spaces in Massachusetts. Now, census data is great, but the moment you leave your home, it doesn't count at all, right? So then we said, the problem is not just about where people live, but the degree of mobility, right? So as designers, we look at different scales, not because we want more precision, but because it begins to ask new questions, questions we hadn't thought about before. So we said, oh my God, let's go back to the national scale and take boundary conditions that look at populations that we can guarantee move seasonally outside of care. National parks in the US. We looked only at those like Grand Canyon that I guarantee there's no care within 30 minutes, okay? It's a quite a bigger population. It's about 100 million people move out of centers of care, okay? And we found out from a VA study of over 100,000 veterans in the US, they've been followed their whole life and basically see when they have episodes and when they die, there's a seasonal peak to stroke. So there's a seasonal peak for when people go out of cities, which is in the summer, and you're, you and I are most likely to have a stroke in the summer. So the moment your population is most likely to have a stroke is when they're most likely to move out. And not just Yosemite, they might go to Paris but you're less likely to know where good care is in Paris because the environment is not familiar, the language is not familiar, the systems are not your systems. How much does that affect this question? All right, let's come to my last little bit here, which is actually going down to the hospital scale, and for the first time, I'm gonna forget we're birds, and I'm gonna imagine we're people in cars, okay? And we're gonna use real time. So we worked with the Department of Transportation in Massachusetts to get actual traffic data. This is one of those circles that we did the analysis before. It's gonna shrink once, and that's during normal traffic, because roads are not straight, right? There's a low traffic lights and so on. And then it's going to shrink a second time during peak traffic. This is morning. And why is peak traffic important? Because not only are you and I most likely to have a stroke in the summer, when you're most likely to move out, but you and I are most likely to have a stroke in the morning. The reason is, is as I'm lying in bed, sleeping at night, I might have a little bit of plaque or something in my vessels. And when I get up, I might change in posture, and the rise in blood pressure, because I have to come talk to you and I'm getting a little nervous, makes sure that that little thing goes pop into my brain. So let's see, normal driving and then when you and I are most likely to get a stroke. All right, so if everybody in the US called the very second that they had a stroke, only about 10% of the population would actually get to care because of all these other factors, traffic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On a drug that is 12%, provides 12% better outcomes. So we're putting lots of money 
into telling people to go to the hospital. We're making a lot of hospitals be centers of care for this disease here with a glass ceiling of 1.2% better outcomes. And the problem is, furthermore, that the classification for stroke is very generic. It's like cut. And most people have paper cuts. And Band-Aids work quite well. But the Band-Aids don't work very well for severe chest wounds. So the category of stroke patients that actually are driving all our mortality and morbidity are not benefiting from the system. The 1.2% better outcomes is happening in the Band-Aid category. But because no one is really thinking about the system as a design challenge. I'm going to work very quickly. Give me a few more minutes. The second thing I want to bring to mind is this idea of from the systemic to thinking about citizen first, the citizen first mentality. Now, this was a food truck in Helsinki, camionette that did crepes, very popular, completely illegal. It's not a car, it's not a restaurant, it doesn't fit any of the categories or silos of government. And in fact, the city said, your solution does not fit our boxes, and hence it's illegal. And the problem is, is that the municipality should have realized that they need to do the inverse. They need to actually shape government to the opportunities that are emerging, not ask the realities that are emerging to shape themselves to the existing structures. This created a lot of scandal, a lot of embarrassment for the city, and now this city has to actually begin to change. Now, this inversion was something that we worked with Jana. We had a program called the Design Exchange Program, embedding designers in the public sector. She went to work for social services, for a project looking at kids at risk. So it turns out that families with kids at risk are the ones that have the hardest time finding the services they need. So let's imagine for a moment it's 2 o'clock in the morning and my daughter is crying and I need help. My first intuition would go online and I go Helsinki uh, Social Services and I get a website that tells me how the organization is organized. This is something that I'm not interested in. Right? We said, invert the logic. Don't tell citizens how you're organized and expect them to understand your logic. Invert it. Let's do, our competition is actually Google, right? We need to ask citizens, what do you need? And we'll find the quickest path to them, okay? So we did a very simple prototype. It's not very pretty, but it's basically a generic number up there, but you can have a pull-down menu, and it tells you the person that's available right now. It happened to be Kiel Meller in Ruaholati, part of town. That's his phone number. You can call him right now. And as we put that out there, we got feedback, and we got feedback on what works, what new functionality, et cetera. We're working from the logic of patients and citizens, not the logic of the organization. We did a public procurement decision for this in four days. We had a live service in two weeks. And I would challenge any business to make a new service decision in four days and have it in the marketplace in two weeks. So when government is smart, it can behave and act very quickly. My last point here is about capability. Now, if you know you need to deliver from a citizen-first perspective, and you, on the other hand of the spectrum, you know you need to work on the systemic end, defining what is the architecture of your solution, where's that capability? There is none of that capability in, in public sector. Sara over here, another embedded designers, worked around engagement in the city of Lahti. This is usually what happens, this is in China, is that the top-down model of government says we're going to put a road here, and the bottom up, Opposition of citizens says, no, you're not, right? So planning is a big problem. She came in to work with a very different co-creational process around planning to engage kids because kids go home and get a passion about the city and prime their parents to be receptive to new ideas. Rather than have citizens go to the municipality, we took the municipality to citizens. And you start changing the power dynamics because his fear, civil servant, is if we open this up to people, we're going to get more complaints. But actually, when we put it on the terms of people and opened it up, those professional complainers got quieted very quickly. They thought they represented the community, and yet the community, when it was present, was telling them to shut up because that was their personal opinion and not the opinion of the broader community. So when you change the dynamics of the power structure, you change very much the kinds of outcomes. Now, this is a project that we delivered, I think, very successfully. We could not have this conversation before the project started. The city of Lahti thought that all they needed was uh, somebody to yell better, to explain to citizens why the ideas are so great. That's why the opposition is there, is because people don't understand. And through this process, they realized, no, it's not about yelling more. It's actually by inverting logics and understanding things. Now the city of Lahti understands that co-creation needs to be a basic principle in all new service delivery. 
This is just to point out that not only there's not the capability, there isn't even the client there. And a lot of times you need to create the client to be enlightened to realize what they didn't know. So in Helsinki, we have a uh, foundation that's called Design Driven City. I encourage you to take a look at it. In a greater municipality area, we've hired designers in the foundation and we're embedding them into projects to build that. So I'm going to end on five very quick priorities for government if they want to innovate on themselves. The first very simple one is there needs to be a very clear political mandate for the public sector, not just to administer what we have, but to innovate how government does its business. Right? If you look at government spending, there is no money for this. There's a lot of innovation money. It's usually money that's put on existing projects as an added booster or to the innovation community outside of government. But none of it is on rethinking how you deliver things. If you give this political mandate, you need to also then resource it. This is about going beyond the rhetoric. Any smart company would put 2 to 6% of their money towards R&D. Government should do the same thing. The third thing is we talk about smaller government. Well, let me be counterintuitive. Why not bigger government? When businesses get slow and dumb, what do they do to become fresh and, and, and keep innovating? They merge and acquire. They merge and acquire those small businesses that have a new logic and they try to bring them into the organization. What if government would merge and acquire some of you? And as you do innovations in the field, try to bring those into central administration. The fourth thing is we need career paths. There are very few designers that have any experience in government and almost no government people who have experience in design. Until we get that cultural dialogue happening, we are not going to get many enlightened clients in terms of design. And the fifth thing is we need to build design capability. And the question is, do we do it outside of government with all the freedom to innovate, but none of the impact? Do we do it at the heart of government with all the levers, but crushed by all the rules and regulations of how one needs to behave or the inside-outside model? I'm a huge advocate for the inside-outside. All right, I'm ending on a challenge here. The first thing is in government, lots of change, but as the Gato Pardo says, everything has to change to remain the same. We need to make the distinction between lots of change that creates no positive sum and the change that creates positive sum. The question for us is there is a belief that crisis is the mother of invention. And I'd like to challenge that a little bit. So this is a Greek parliamentary hearing where they need to pass a bunch of laws because the EU and the Troika have put a lot of economic conditions for loans. And basically, you'll see what happens. In, uh Κύριε Πρόεδρε, είμαστε τρει άνθρωποι στην Επιτροπή. Έτσι θα γίνει η ψηφοφορία του κώδικα περί δικηγόρων. Αυτή τη στιγμή έχουν κατατεθεί οι απόψει των εκπροσώπων και των εισηγητών. Λοιπόν, προχωρούμε στην ψηφοφορία. Θα, με τρει βουλευτέ. Στην ψηφοφορία, ένα-ένα τα άρθρα για να είμαστε τυπικά εντάξει. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 1, εγκρίνεται κατά πλειοψηφία. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 2, εγκρίνεται κατά πλειοψηφία. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 3, εγκρίνεται κατά πλειοψηφία. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 29, εγκρίνεται κατά πλειοψηφία. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 30, εγκρίνεται κατά πλειοψηφία. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 31, όπω τροποποιήθηκε από τον κύριο Υπουργό. Όχι, ποιο λέει ναι στο 31. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο. Ποιο λέει ναι, λέμε όχι στο 31. Ποιο λέει ναι. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο 32, όπω. Ποιο λέει ναι, κύριε Πρόεδρε, πώ λέτε κατά πλειοψηφία. Μα δεν είναι ψηφοφορία αυτή που κάνετε. Εγκρίνεται το άρθρο. So I doubt this idea that when we get to crisis, somehow it's going to make us more innovative. I actually think at the moment of crisis is when we are the least strategic. And that's why I think we need to build innovation capability. Imagine Greece, the home of democracy. This is the first thing that goes out the window when there are challenges. Now, there's the mainstream out there that's based on the past. It's moving very quickly. And my big fear is that design is a bit of space dust we tend to choose things that might be interesting and so on. And we need to be willing to go into the mainstream and do really, really bad, really, really ugly, really difficult kinds of projects, not the marginal stuff. So I'm going to end on this. Design needs to do something new. This is a speech by, well, not a speech, but an interview with Muhammad Ali. I got to read it to you because it may not be that clear. So he says, this is before a really big fight, he realizes that to win the fight, he needs to do something different. This is our challenge. To go from the old model to the new model, we need to do something different, right? I've done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. Handcuffed lightning, thrown thunder in jail. And that's bad. 
Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. But he says it's much nicer. Jeez, I've done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. Bad dude. Bad. I would say design needs to get bad. Thank you.